name is Zeke, and uh, I, we, my, me and my family have been going to this church since about 2018. And uh, I used to be able to be easily influenced by uh, the wrong crowd at school, but I've uh, passed that. And um, up until about a month and a half ago, I was uh, saved, and soon I'm gonna be getting baptized. And this is my story. My name is Justin Pinkert. I was raised in the Assembly of God churches. Um, I was doing good until about junior high, and I started getting into partying and everything. And, and in high school, I got into about 15 years old. I got into methamphetamine until I was 20 years old. And I found out my daughter was going to be born. And about six months into the pregnancy, I I quit cold turkey and it was it was real rough. And then went through 13 years of a uh, mentally abusive relationship with my daughter's mother. And then after those 13 years, I m met my wife Katie, and she took me to church for my first time in 13 years. And um, that was the best thing that ever happened to me because I got to go back to the Lord, and I was saved, and I was baptized, and now I've got a wife and two beautiful kids, and a happy family and I'm living my best life as I can yeah I backslide every once in a while but I'm not perfect nobody is else so I that's all I really have to say and that's my story now that my friend is Easter people giving testimony they're telling their stories don't you love to hear stories? Because you all have one, right? I mean, we all have a story to tell. Some of you have a lot of stories about how God has worked in your life, about how God has intervened in your life. Easter people tell stories. They tell an Easter people story. That's what the series we've been in for. Well, we started last week, and we looked at Mary Magdalene's story. Mary from Magdala. Say Magdala. I just know you like to say that. So, so that was the story we looked at today. Today we're going to look at Joseph of Arimathea. Say Arimathea. Yeah, he was a wealthy Jewish man who buried the body of Jesus after the crucifixion. And there are a lot of legends about him. One legend says he visited Britain with the young Jesus. Another legend says that after the crucifixion, he brought the Holy Grail to Glastonbury in Somerset. And he started a church. That would have been before Indiana Jones got his hands on the Holy Grail. Just kidding, right? None of that is in the Bible, just so you know. But Joseph does show up in all four Gospels. We have 16 verses that tell his story, where we get to hear his story. And he never really speaks a word, and yet we get to hear at least a part of his story. So Joseph of Arimathea is mentioned by all four Gospel writers. He shows up in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah doesn't really name him, but I want you to read it in Isaiah 53 verse 9. Look, it's on the screen. He had done no wrong and he had never deceived anyone. He's talking about Jesus, prophesying about Jesus, but he was buried like a criminal and he was put in a rich man's grave. The rich guy is Joseph of Arimathea. He's in the Old Testament. I love the fact that all four gospel writers want us to hear his story. Now, most of you already know we have four Gospels in the New Testament. But if you haven't been around church very long, you, you might not know that. So we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are called Gospels. And they're telling the story of Jesus' life and Jesus' ministries. And, and then we have what we call the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we call them that because they're fairly similar. But all four of the Gospels want us to know about Joseph of Arimathea. So turn in or turn on your Bible to Mark chapter 15. Turn in or turn on your Bible to Mark chapter 15. We're going to start at verse 43. And I want us to read it together. And if you're there, say hallelujah. 
All right, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God. That's interesting. He went boldly to Pilate. Your version may say courageously. He went to Pilate and he asked for the body of Jesus, Jesus' body. Verse 44, Pilate was surprised to hear that he, had already, he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, placed it in a tomb, cut out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. All four gospel writers want us to know where he's from, Arimathea. Luke tells us it was a city of the Jews, Judean city. Now, you won't find it in your Bible maps in the back of your Bible. Scholars really don't even know or don't agree on where it is even today. Uh, most believe it was probably northwest of Jerusalem, about 20 miles. So he's from Arimathea. Matthew tells us that he has some money, that he's rich, and that he's prominent. He's a member of the council. That's the Sanhedrin, the 70 plus one. That's, by the way, just think Supreme Court. Are you ready? Making decisions, calling the shots, uh, you know, making those important decisions. So he's not just taking up a seat. Notice what it says. He's important. He's prominent. He's honorable. He's a person with integrity and character and distinction. Luke calls him a good and just man. So he was a man of influence. He was a man of affluence. He was respected. He had political power. He was a mover and shaker in the political and religious world. So we need to understand this part of his story because later on we're going to see how much he's risking when he comes out of the shadows and he asks for the body of Jesus to bury him properly. So what's Joseph's story anyway? Well, Matthew says he's rich. Got that? Luke and Mark tell us he's a member of the council. Mark wants us to know that he's a prominent member of the council. Mark and Luke tell us that Joseph of Arimathea is waiting for the kingdom of God. That's important. Matthew just tells us he was a disciple of Jesus. And then John adds to that and he says, well, yeah, he's a disciple of Jesus, but he's a secret disciple because he feared the Jewish leaders. A secret disciple. Luke wants us to know that he had not consented to the council's decision to crucify Jesus. So all four gospels tell us that he asked Pilate uh, for the body of Jesus. Now, I think it's important, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. I want to read John's account in John chapter 19, verse 38. I'll give you a little minute to get there. John chapter 19, verse 38. He sheds a little more light, uh, gives us, uh, drills down into a little more details. In verse 38, let's read it together. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, notice this, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. And with Pilate's permission, he came and he took the body away. He, he, was, he was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Now, you remember Nick at night, right? He comes full circle. Uh, I mean, he had come to Jesus in the, in, the, in the night. And you remember this story. I don't even remember the story. Nicodemus and Jesus, well, what must I do to be born again? What do I need to do to be born again? You know, he's a little confused about this spiritual birth and physical birth. And he says, well, how can I do that? I mean, how can I enter into my mother's womb again and be born? And of course, he said, hey, you're missing the point. That's not what we're talking about. So this is the same guy, Nicodemus. And now he's come full circle. He shows up in the day. You remember he crept through the shadows to meet Jesus. But now he's coming to the cross to serve Jesus. And read on. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and alloys, about 75 pounds. Now, you need to remember last week, we, we talked about that Jewish embalming custom of wrapping their dead in half the body weight in spices. So, so here we go. Verse 40, taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. Verse 41, and at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, in a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Now, Matthew is going to tell us this is Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. He cut it out of the rock. That's interesting. And so verse 42 says this, because it was the Jewish day of preparation. What does that mean? It was the day before the Sabbath. And since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. So that's Joseph of Arimathea's Easter people story. 
So what I want to do is just pull three things out of this Easter people story. Three things that I believe need to be a part of our story. And then I want to wrap it up with something I've never seen before in this story. And, and I've read it many, many times. It's some things that God gave to me to give to you. Here's the first thing in our Easter people story. And write this one down because what? Uh, note takers are world changers. Write this one down. One of the first things we see is a fulfilled destiny. Now we read it in Isaiah 53, 9 earlier. Isaiah prophesied that Jesus would be buried in the tomb of a rich guy. 700 years before Joseph Arimathea took Jesus' body off of the cross, 700 years, Isaiah said it's going to happen. Now, here's what I want you to get today. Listen, you have a God-given destiny. Look at someone next to you and say, God gave you a destiny. God gave you a destiny. I'm not sure you're wide awake, so let's try it again. Look at somebody and say, God gave you a destiny. He did. That's what he told Jeremiah. Read this one in Jeremiah 1.5. Here's what he said. He said, before I formed you, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before I formed you, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And I love what the psalmist does with that in Psalm 139. The the psalmist is just saying, here's what God has done for me. My frame was not hidden from you. Listen to what he says. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, verse 16, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. You guys get that. Here's the deal. He's got a plan. (laughs) Don't mess it up. (laughs) He's got a plan. You know, that's what I used to do when I was coaching football. I would say to my guys all the time, here's the plan. And we've studied this. We've got a plan. We have watched hours and hours of video. We've determined that on third down and five, here's what they like to do. So here's what we're going to do. Here's our plan. Don't mess it up. Follow the plan. Listen to me. God's got a plan for you. Don't mess it up. (laughs) He's got a plan for you. He's got a destiny for you. And if we want to be a part of God's plan, we have to do our part. It's been like that forever. It's been like that forever. God told Abraham in Genesis 18, you remember, you're going to be the father of what? Many nations. And I've got a plan. Don't mess it up. You have a destiny. So Abraham's part was to cooperate with the Lord. If Abraham didn't do what God had told him to do, he was going to mess it up. God couldn't fulfill his promise to make Abraham a father of many nations, even though that was God's will for him. He has a plan. The same is true for us. It's God's will that we be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. It's his will to manifest himself through Je- in the same way that he manifested himself through Jesus. Our part is to simply walk in a pleasing way to him. We're supposed to think his thoughts. We're supposed to speak his words. We're supposed to walk in his spirit. We're supposed to walk in his ways. He's got a plan. Don't mess it up. Now, if we want to fulfill our divine destiny and enjoy the fullness of the power of God in our lives, we we have some decisions to make. And we have to be determined to stop living to please ourselves and start living every moment, every day to please the Father. Joseph Arimathea had a decision to make. And here's the thing. Get this. Under Roman Empire, if someone was crucified and was too poor, had no one to bury them, then they would just leave the body suspended on the cross to be picked clean by animals. Or then they would just throw it into a mass grave. So Joseph had to step up. There had to be a dedication to destiny. And here's why. Because Jesus had to be placed in a rich man's tomb. Because in every society, in every time period, no matter where you live, get this, everybody knows where the rich people hang out. If, if I say, let me prove it to you. If I say Park Avenue, you say New York. If I say Rodeo Drive, you say Beverly or California, around here we might say Highland Hills or Saddlebrook or Fremont Hills. You, you, You know where the rich people hang out. You know where the rich people live. And here's why that's important. Jesus couldn't be buried in a mass grave where no one could find his body. He had to be buried in a rich man's tomb. And the greatest story ever told had to have Roman guards. It had to be accessible because God is displaying his power in the resurrection. 
And there had to be an empty tomb. And there had to be witnesses. And we know there were over 500. Probably a whole lot more than that. But the empty tomb makes all of the difference. They could see it. They could talk about it. Do you see how important Joseph of Arimathea's determination to fulfill his destiny was? Now, now get this one and write it down. Your story comes with a destiny, and to fulfill it takes determination. Somebody do like that. This is learning how to flourish under fire. Anybody know what that's like? And if you're waiting for the coast to be clear, get this, you're going to miss it because the coast will probably never be clear. And so any mother in here will tell you, any mother in here will tell you, the closer you get to birthing the baby, the more severe the labor pains. I don't know that personally, but I think some of you ladies do, because it takes determination. And so with God's dream always comes hell's nightmare. Now don't miss this. If we don't figure out how to endure the nightmare, we will never experience the dream. And here's the deal. Most of us give up and quit. We miss God's destiny. We miss God's dream that he's planted in our hearts because the nightmare blows us away. And the devil, listen, the devil will derail God's destiny if you're not determined to fight the fear. Endure hell's nightmare. Most of us don't make it to the other side because we're stuck on this side with the nightmare. Now, why don't you go ahead this morning? Why don't you go ahead, if you're online with us or you're with us in person, why don't you go ahead and name the nightmare? You lost your job. God still has a plan. God still has a destiny. And it's on the other side of the nightmare. You lost your spouse and it hurts and you're lonely and it doesn't feel good at all. But God still has a plan. He has a destiny and it's on the other side of the nightmare. Your destiny is on the other side of your fear. Your destiny is on the other side of your pain. And so your nightmare is the pathway to your destiny. Do you get it? So here's a question. Can God trust you with trouble? I mean, listen, most of us can do pretty good with God as long as things are going okay. <laughs> if I'm not in the nightmare and the dream is pretty clear and the destiny is in front of me, I'm pretty good, you know? I'm in good shape. But when the nightmare comes in, when hell's nightmare comes knocking, that, that's where the rubber meets the road, you see? That's where it gets more difficult. That's where you have to determine, can God trust you with trouble? I mean, listen, can God turn trouble into triumph? Can, can, can God turn pain into praise? How many of you played baseball when you were a kid? Go ahead, raise your hand. Oh, yeah, good number of you. You played a little baseball. How many of you have ever watched baseball? How many of you have ever heard the word baseball? Okay, so, so everybody this applies to today. You, you see, when you were a kid and you were playing baseball, maybe some of you young people are still playing ball. That, that's all right. When you come to the plate, you have to learn what to swing at. I mean, you really do, and it's taken me a while. I, I, I'm going to freely admit and, and openly confess that, that I'm learning. I'm not there yet, but I'm learning to not swing at every ball that comes my way. You, you see, here's the deal. You know, I, I'm not just talking about not swinging at bad things, but sometimes not swinging at some good things because sometimes it could be a good thing, but if it's not connected to your destiny, you, you're just creating some error. And, and I need to reserve my swing for the things that are connected to my destiny. Here's the problem. Some of you might be swinging at things that aren't in your destiny. You know, I'm going to start this business or I'm going to start that business. You know, I'm just going to take this job. Well, I don't like that job. I'm going to take another job. Well, that job didn't work out. I'm going to take another job. I, I'm just going to buy this car. Well, maybe not that car, but this car. I'm going to buy that truck. I, I'm going to live here. Well, no, no, I'm not going to live here. I'm going to live there. And sometimes we're out there swinging at things that aren't in alignment with our destiny. Listen, I really want to have friends that are in alignment with my destiny. I'm really getting to the age where now I can't afford to carry a lot of dead weight. Maybe when I was 20, okay, <laughs> but not now. It, 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 it's, it's me learning how to become closer to God's destiny. Because the clock is ticking, people. Yeah, now, maybe I can carry someone a little while. But at some point, they have to decide to get up and walk. I mean, because God gave you a destiny, and it's your destiny. It's not my destiny. God gave me a de He gave you a destiny. He called you by name. He formed you in the womb. And, and, and listen, he's given you something to do. 
you know, I mean, listen, I've been pastoring a long time, and, and people will say, well, I'm having trouble in my marriage. Well, hey, what, have you talked to God about that? Well, no. I mean, are you in the Word? How's your discipleship? Are you growing in grace and knowledge? When was the last time you got into these altars, got on your face before God? I mean, listen, I can keep carrying you, but at some point, you got to get on some big boy pants as a believer and decide that I am a disciple of Christ and I can grow in grace and knowledge. God has given me a destiny and I am to fulfill that destiny to the honor and to the praise of the King of Kings. What's your destiny? Because God gave you one, now you need to fulfill it. See, here's our problem. We love Romans 8, 28, don't we? God works all things together for the good of them that love God and that are called according. We love that. That's awesome. We forget about what Paul said when we have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, he said, but it's Christ who lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh. Listen, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We forget the fact that we are his workmanship, he said, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So you have a destiny. Easter people need to fulfill their destiny. Easter people need to be dedicated to their destiny. But there's something else I want you to get, and it's this, and we'll go to number two. Easter people need to tell the story of how they deal with detours. You see, when you tell your story, let me ask you, are there any detours in your story? I mean, have you had a few weird turns along the way? Uh, Places you never thought you would go. Some scenic or maybe not so scenic, unexpected roads you had to travel. Anybody have that in their story? Joseph of Arimathea knew a little bit something about unexpected turns in his life. Matthew said he was rich. He obviously had connections because he could show up in Pilate's palace and he could ask for Jesus' body. Now, this was a detour for him because, listen, under Roman law, only the family could come and ask for Jesus' body. And under Jewish law, he would be ceremonially unclean for touching a dead body. But Mark says this, he took courage or he boldly went to Pilate and he asked for Jesus' body. That was a huge risk. Now remember, Joseph was a prominent member of the Sanhedrin. He was risking everything when he walked into Pilate's palace. He was risking everything that he had. He could lose it all, his wealth, his influence, his reputation. He could even lose his own life. Life could take him on a crazy, wild ride that he never expected. What a detour. He knew something about that. Has anyone besides me ever woke up on a strange road in a strange place that you didn't recognize and you didn't like and you wondered, how on earth did I get here? Anybody? So now you have a detour to deal with, right? That's part of your Easter people story. Have you ever found yourself in a situation that's completely contradictory to your dream or your destiny? It just feels like this is a word for somebody. I don't know who. Somebody today listening that that God has given you a dream. God has given to you a destiny. But then you got fired. (laughs) You found yourself on some detour and you didn't know how you got there. I mean, everything seemed to be going all right until it wasn't. And now you're staring out the window at some unfamiliar territory. And here's what happens. The devil comes along and he says, where's God now? Isn't that how he works? Yeah. Where's God now? And perhaps maybe you even changed your character to match your condition. Here's a word if that's you. There's another Joseph we talk about in the Old Testament. You remember the guy? You remember him, right? God gave him, actually literally gave to him a dream. His brothers were going to bow down to him. He was going to rise to power. He was going to keep the nation of Israel from, from dying during a famine. There was a detour, though. He's now in prison unjustly. There's a detour. But before he can be the prince, he has to be the prison guy. And he shows us three things. And I want you to write these down real quick. These are three things that ought to be a part of all of our lives when we become detoured. This is how you deal with detours and write them down. First one is this. The Bible says the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. <laughs> he said, if you're in it, I'm in it with you. You you may think you're lost, but I know where you are. Even if you lose everything, you won't lose me. 
And so if you're on a detour, remember this. Remember that the Lord is with you. He's with you. Regardless if you even recognize the terrain, regardless if you're out somewhere and you say, man, I've never seen this before in my life. This is crazy. God is, the Lord is with you. If you know him, he's walking with you. He's ever present in your life. There's something else you need to remember in a detour, and that is he showed him mercy. You see, mercy is a part of Joseph's story, but it's a part of your story too. Because here's how that works. Because when you're on the wrong road, you're tempted to keep driving. You've made a mistake. You've gone the wrong way. And if you're like the normal male persuasion guy, you're not going to stop and ask for directions. Amen. See, you hear my wife say that clearly, right? Amen. But, but here's the problem. We do this spiritually and we resist mercy. You know, because we're not going to ask for help. It's easier to live in defeat than it is to ask for help. I mean, let's just get up and make the donuts. I mean, let's just, get, you know, trudge our way through this. It's a lot. The Bible says what? The Bible says his mercies are new when? Every morning. But you have to receive it. <laughs> yeah, he has some new mercies for you every day of your life on the road that you travel. But you have to receive it. But look at the third thing. He gave him favor. And see, God gave Joseph favor with the warden. You know the story. Even in this detour, the steps, the Bible says, of a good man are ordered by God. What's he doing now? He's running the prison. And that's what we call the favor of God. Now, you think the favor of God is when you pull into Walmart and you say, and God, I need a parking place close to the door, and all of a sudden, boom, favor of God. I say this to Brenda all the time. I don't know. It's uncanny. It's like I can go to Walmart. We go to the mall. We be out somewhere. And, and, and almost invariably, without fail, I'll pull in and it's like the Red Sea opens up. Whoa. And I've got a parking spot right in the front. You want to hang with me if you're going to Wally World. I'll tell you this right now. And I say to her, I say, that's the favor of God. <laughs> Look at that. And she laughs at me or slaps me or something. I like the ringtone, but uh, we, let's put it on a mic next time. That sounds good. But, but that's what we need is the favor of God. Amen. Remember when you're dealing with a detour in your life. Go back to Joseph of Arimathea. Let's, let's do that me, a, a minute. And, and uh, let's talk about the fact that God gave him favor with Pilate. But, but let me give you the last one. Are you ready? Here it is. A definite decision. That should be number three, not number two. A definite decision. Joseph of Arimathea had a decision to make. The disciples had run off. You know the story. Jesus' family couldn't afford to bury him. He had a decision to make. Here's what he had to decide. He had to decide to either continue as a secret disciple or he had to come out and let people know that he was a follower of Christ. Here's a question for somebody. Are you ready? Has God been calling you to something and you've been putting it off because you think you're going to lose something? God's been calling you to something and you've been putting it off because you're afraid you're going to have to give up something. See, Easter people have a story to tell, and it really all starts with the decision. And you've got to love what Jesus said to the disciples in Matthew chapter 16, 24. Here's what he said. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and what? Follow me. What? You're talking about a cross? That's a definite decision. <laughs> That's a life-altering decision. You and I don't really have an Easter people story without making that decision. And so that leads me to a really important question. And I want you to listen to this question. Have you made that decision? See, see I'm, not, I'm not asking if someone else has made that decision or if you've made the decision to be a good person or come to church or, or live a good moral life, I'm asking you, if you've made the decision to take up your cross and follow him. I've been contemplating the level of commitment. You know, I've been reading some people about this new phenomenon that our world is in. You know, we, we, we have our churches that continue to decline. People don't come, <laughs> you know, like they used to. But now then we enter in COVID-19 worldwide pandemic. 
And so we go online, and, and, and I'm all about that, as you well know. You, you know we're, we have people online with us right now through YouTube and Facebook and, and through the website. That's cool. I mean, we want to get the gospel pumped out into this world any way we can so that people who are dead to their sin can be brought to life through the power of Christ. Amen? Amen. And so we want to do that. But it's a crazy phenomenon, a two-edged sword when you really think about it. Because some people today are staying home when they actually could be here in person experiencing the encouragement of the body of Christ, but they're not here. Why? Now we can say, well, that's all bad. That's all bad. That's all bad. No, it's not all bad. I, I'm, I'm thinking of Tom and Kay Snodgrass. They're, they're in Arizona right now. Tom's, or Kay's not doing real well. She was in the hospital all day yesterday. And, and, and so now they will tune in this morning. I don't know if they're with us, Becky, if you see them online. But, but I know there are people who have those situations and circumstances where they can still be a part of their church family in that way. And I think it's awesome. I'm thinking about people I know in Washington State and people in Dallas, Texas today, people in Chicago, Illinois, uh, people even in Germany right now who will be tuning in with us. You know why? Uh, Because they can't be here, but but, but they want to be a part of this body, this group, the Northwest Church. So it's awesome. So don't get me wrong, Uh, but I've been thinking a lot about the level of commitment that, that we have. And somebody says, well, I, I, you know, I can't come. Do, do you know what the price of gas is? And I go, dude, I, I get it. I mean, there are a lot of numbers uh, that are in front of my normal numbers now. I know that's true for you too. Um, but you can still go play golf and spend some gas. You should go do the things you want to do and spend some gas. So maybe you need to miss a meal if you need to that you eat out normally so that you can be in the body. What's your level of commitment? That's the question. Jesus wasn't playing any games with this. He said, take up a cross. He didn't say if it's convenient for you. Hey, by the way, you know, if gas is cheap enough, you know, then, then, you know, just take up a little piece of the cross. He said, take up the cross. What are we talking about? Dying to yourself and living unto him. And so, I, you know, hey, I'm not getting on anybody. I'm just saying, what's your level of commitment? I, I think this verse, it's incumbent upon us to answer this question. Have you made a definite decision to be a follower of Christ? Well, you see, Joseph Arimathea, hey, he's a good example. <laughs> now, now let, me, let me wrap it up with some of the things that I've been thinking a lot about this. And I want to leave you with this this morning. I've been thinking about it for a while. And it's been a, uh, I've been trying to picture those guys. You know, here's Joseph of Arimathea. Here's, here's Nicodemus, Nick at night. And, and they're going to the cross to take the body of Jesus down. Now remember this. Jesus hung on the cross for six hours. The longest crucifixion on record was eight days. The Romans loved to leave the bodies up on the cross. And Joseph just had enough pool that he goes to Pilate, and Pilate gives him the body of Jesus. I want you to think about this. This man, this not-so-secret disciple now, listen to this, he had to get a pry bar, and he had to pry those nails out of the feet and the hands. It's really not the hands, uh, because science has already proved to us that it couldn't have really been the hands. It won't, you can't suspend a body on the weight of, of a nail here. It has to be right in here. Because there's a specific bone that that if you get into the right place, you can suspend a body there. He had to pry the nails out of an old rugged Roman cross and out of the body of Jesus. Get the scene. I've I've been trying to picture this scene in my mind. There they are. There's Joseph of Arimathea. There's there's Nicodemus. And and can you picture the bloody scene? Because he had been beaten, the Bible says, beyond recognition. The crown of thorns had pierced his brow and blood flowed. And then he puts his body, puts the body of Jesus on his back. Are you getting the picture? I mean, do you understand? Joseph of Arimathea had the blood of Jesus on his hands and on his arms and running down his shoulders and all over his body. 
wasn't clean, wasn't sterile. It wasn't safe or neat or tidy. It was messy. And I've been wondering, this is the thing, I've been wondering, do you think Joseph of Arimathea, as, as he was covered in the blood of the Savior, could, could he have thought that, that what that blood might have meant? Did he see new life? Because new life is messy. I've witnessed three life births, three life births, you know, human births, and, and, and a lot of animal births. Some of you have two, right, Melissa? You, you've seen a few of those. I, I've witnessed those, and I can tell you it was messy. They come out looking like aliens. I, I know they're beautiful, and your children and your grandchildren, they're the most beautiful children in the world, and there's no more, but, but they come out, in my mind, looking like aliens. They're all a mess, conehead thing, and Stuff all over them. <laughs> it's messy. New life is messy. It, it, it's bloody and it comes through a very difficult canal. And I don't know what Joseph was thinking about. Was he thinking for new life to come, something had to die? Someone had to die. Was he thinking without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin? But see, it had to happen. It had to happen so you could be born again. The cross had to happen. The shed blood had to happen. The empty tomb, if the shed blood doesn't happen, then the empty tomb can't happen. Do you get the Easter story? Maybe you're ready to get an Easter story of your own. (laughs) Do, Do you have an Easter story? Because maybe we need to back up, and as we began this series talking about Easter people, one of the things maybe we should have began talking about is, do you have an Easter story? I mean, we've got people we're putting on video, and they're telling their story. It's an Easter story, because an Easter story is about death to life, salvation, coming to know Christ. But here's a question for you. Do you have an Easter story? And I don't, want to be, I don't want you to be confused about what I'm asking you today. I'm not asking you uh, like one guy said to me this week when, when I was witnessing to him. And he said to me, well, you know, I, I'm a member of a church. I said, well, that's great. And so am I. Wow. And, and, and then as we began and continued to talk, I never once heard a death to life story. I heard about the church. That's great. I love church. But that's not the Easter story. And I hear people talking about how good they are and maybe their mom and dad attended church. My mom and dad, man, they were in church every time. You know, when I was a kid, I went to Sunday school. You know, I used to get those little, little buttons, you know, perfect attendance, got all of that, running down to the floor. Yeah, I, I, and, and, you, and you know, I got baptized. It's not an Easter story. Your Easter story is on that day when you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt. I mean, you didn't have any qualms. You understood the fact that you were a sinner in need of grace. <laughs> and, and man, you, you felt the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. And, and if you were seven or 77 or 177, however old you were, you recognized the need. You knew that death to life meant Jesus went to a cross and he poured out his shed blood for you and that he went into a tomb, borrowed tomb. It was Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. But he didn't stay in the tomb. Sunday showed up. Jesus on the third day came out of the tomb, resurrected to do to new life. And there was a day when you called on the name of Jesus and you invited him into your heart. I'm not asking if you're Baptist or Methodist or Pentecostal or if you did this or did that. I'm, I'm, I'm asking, has there been that moment? Because that, my friend, is your Easter story. Amen. Easter people have that story. Isn't it awesome that we have so much in common, even with Joseph of Arimathea and Mary, you know, Mary, the one from Magdala. We we have something in common with them. What is it? We're Easter people because we have been brought from death to life. Have you had that experience? See, I can't help but think about that correlation 
It's Joseph of Arimathea. Get, put yourself there, would you? On, on, on a place called Gagatha, the place of the skull, Calvary's Mountain. Because Jesus had already come down to Via Della Rosa. Jesus had already made, made those seven statements uh, from the cross. And he said, to stelatai. What is that? Uh, Greek for, it's finished. What's finished? <laughs> the shed blood of Christ for the remission of sin. Put yourself in that place. And then ask yourself the question. Have I made a definite decision? Have I made a definite decision? And maybe some of you are still investigating, and that's cool. Maybe some of you are online with us, you're still investigating, uh, you know, the veracity, the, the, the truth. You, you're still trying to determine. You might be vacillating between, you know, is this right? Is this wrong? You know, I hear this, I hear that. And you're still, you're still investigating. That's okay. Please continue to investigate. But at some point, you're going to make a decision. Even if you don't make a decision, a non-decision is still a decision. <laughs> so be a, be a, Easter person, make a definite decision.